Great. Um, let me see. Okay, awesome. So for Again, this workshop is presented by HubSpot for Startups, and there's a couple of things that we provide, and I'm going to go into um, some more details about that by the end of the session. But for those of you who may not be familiar with HubSpot for Startups, um, we partner very closely with accelerators, um, incubators like Launch New York, uh, VCs and other investors alike around the world to accelerate growth for their startups. Uh, so some of the things that we provide as part of our partnership with Launch New York is that we provide educational resources and exclusive webinars such as this. We love startups and entrepreneurs. So in addition to our startup program, HubSpot also has a 30 million venture fund that um, aligns with, for startups that aligns with our um, global mission to help our ecosystem grow better. So check it out. And if you have any questions, feel free to connect with me. So thanks again, Marnie, for your warm introduction. Uh, but a very quick intro of myself. Um, again, I'm leading our partnerships in the Eastern US and helping startups grow through mentorship. Um, in my role, I build comprehensive resources designed to help founders at the earliest stages of their journey, such as events, year-round founder engagement, and intensive uh, hands-on workshops such as this. Uh, so I took a conventional path and really started my career in the financial sector, where I spent a couple of years in both private and capital markets before venturing into the startup world. I then quit my corporate job and <laughs> ventured into the startup world where I first joined an accelerator to help them build from the scratch and successfully scale up from there. After that, I joined a venture group based out of Hong Kong called um, Everest Ventures, advising startups and assisting them with go-to-market. And that ultimately led to my journey into HubSpot for Startups where I now lead partnerships and programming um, and work with startups across stages and sectors um, and help them on go to market from raising and growth best practices. But jumping into our agenda, as I said, we're also gonna, we're going to talk about how to adapt our strategy in the current climate. Um, we'll go into some higher level stuff of building your buyer persona, how to generate awareness for your product, We'll talk about SEO strategy, how to craft your message and how to convert the traffic that you're getting to your site. Um, how do you automate the entire process and how do you know whether or not you're being successful? So we'll, we're going to go through all of that. Hopefully that's what you guys tuned in for. But what I will say is that there's also a million uh, recorded webinars that you can watch online. We have a lot of great resources for you as well, but if you're going to be locked in and be part of this session, there's a reason why you're dedicating your time to this. So I would like this to be as interactive and conversational as possible. There's going to be questions I'm going to ask you, so please um, keep your chat open and feel free to pop your answers into the chat. So first, let's talk about um, how to adapt for the current environment. So HubSpot has the benefit of having 70,000 customers around the world. So we get an amazing amount of data to be able to see what's going on, how are people reacting, what's working, what's not working, and what can we do with it. So one of the things that you're probably seeing from your own email inbox is that we're seeing that there's a 50 to 60% increase in sequences that are being sent, but we're also seeing that there's an increase in the open rate. So more emails are being sent from where people are opening them. So we also know that this is an effective means to get messaging out about your business. We also receive an uptake in live chat usage usage. So if this is something that this isn't something uh, that you already have on your site, I would definitely consider um, adding that. And it's also a feature of HubSpot. We know that people are researching brands online even more than they were a year ago. And we're seeing that the monthly traffic increase is about 13% for businesses across the board on our platform. We're also seeing that customers are initiating a lot more of these conversations. So we're already in a more inbound environment. 
So what do we do with this information? How does this kind of funnel into marketing and the sales mechanisms that you have? Focus on empathy and sensitivity when you're interacting with your clients or customers. You have no idea of what it is that's going on in their lives. This is a great time to be able to show that you're a helper to add resources to what they're doing and work off of referrals. This should be where you're thinking about how to build a long-term relationship. Uh, this might not be the time that you're going to have a huge boom in new customers, but it might be the time where you're lining up those customers for later or building out your referral network. Think about who you should be talking to. You want to be looking at some of the industries that you're working with might be better suited for your product in the current environment or they might not be the best fit anymore. So don't be afraid to dig in and see what is the best fit for you right now. And I would also say lean into having a consultative selling approach. So not just kind of pushing your products, but getting to learn a lot more about your customer and building those relationships. So that way you can have a more personalized touch and you're going to get a little bit further um, in this current market. In terms of what you should be focusing on, we're seeing a lot of our customers are not focused on what the strategy for success is two quarters out from now. They're focused on what can I do in this next three months is going to be impactful and what can I do that's going to set me up for success in a year because that in between spaces are a bit uncertain. So that's how you should be thinking about your timeline for planning and also be focusing on providing online resources on social media, email marketing, virtual events. We're seeing huge uptake in all of these and you just want to make sure you're also queued up for recovery. In terms of messaging, people are trying to be more of a service to their clients and just acknowledging the fact that the world is different. Um, we're seeing that a lot of our customers are shifting their advertising to focus on empathy and facilitating this community connection, all while being able to provide content that actually inspires. One of the things that we're seeing in our marketing content is that there's a bigger focus on the why. Why are you growing this business right now? Why are you launching this? Not all of us have businesses that are essential services and a lot of these are elective that they can be nice to have. So they can fit and solve for compelling pain points, but focus on why these solutions even matter. So I think this is a great example from Gabrielle Perry era, who is one of the founders that works with us. She focuses on, she focuses on the arts and has said they're focused on the why. Why their books, stories, poetry are important for our survival. Right now, why is the work that they're doing um, in order of uh, doing important in order to continue to inspire the people that they're serving? We're also seeing that retention is the new acquisition. I know that a lot of you are probably still in the early stage of your business development, so I'm not going to go um, into too much detail, but there's a bigger shift now more than ever to focus on how to retain customers how to get the most referrals out of, out of this in order to be able to grow your business. We're seeing that one of the ways this is, that this is happening is that businesses are prioritizing uh, the customer experience, whether you're discounting your offerings or adjusting your offerings to help impact the customers or prospects. For example, the way we prioritize customer experience at HubSpot is to add more features to our CRM, to our free CRM. We've discounted our starter packages and paid some of our agency partners up front to help them with cash flow. So these are some of the things that we're doing to help navigate this uh, current climate. Lastly, let's talk about messaging. Uh, you want to be empathizing with your clients and prospects who need solutions, not pitches. So there might be leads that you have, you're just choosing not to pursue because they're struggling right now. Here's an example. This is a founder from one of the startups that we work with. What he did is that they separated out each industry that they work with. They created an outline of, new of the new challenges that they may be facing and the solutions that they may be looking for. They realized that in certain industries, they're no longer the solution, but then there are other industries where they're perfectly positioned to um, at this time. So for the ones that they're no longer a great solution for, they really took the time to craft a thoughtful message saying that they're no longer following up on the sales opportunity, 
but they're going to be there for when this is all over. So this is a great example of adapting your messaging. It's not just about closing the opportunity in this next quarter, but about setting yourself up for success in the long term, a year down the line. So let's talk more about inbound. I would love to know how many people now or have heard of inbound marketing before. Feel free to pop your answer into the chat for me. Is this something that you already know about or a brand new concept to you? know a bit about it, used it before. Awesome. So looks like, and I would also assume that a lot of you have heard of it, but uh, uh, have no idea what it is, but familiar with it um, or not familiar with it, that's totally fine. Emily, we have a couple, it's Danielle, we have a couple that it's new to people as well, so. Oh, okay. Just getting started. Tracking market efforts right now through Excel. Need by the way, know a little bit about it. Sounds great. So seems like you guys. Awesome, awesome. Thanks so much for your answers, everyone. Um, so HubSpot coined the term inbound marketing, and what inbound marketing really um, means is creating a strategy where you bring leads to you and your customers are coming to you organically. They've already seen you as an additive or help to their business, to their lives. What this means is uh, that for your business, these leads would convert a much uh, better and higher rate. These are much happier customers that convert faster because they're better educated about your products. Uh, what you can get from sessions like today's uh, combined with our software is a platform that's going to help you configure a strategy for bringing in and closing these inbound leads. So then you might ask, how do you, um, how do you attract, you know, how do you attract leads to you and to your products? Well, let's start at the beginning. How do you generate awareness? How do you have a great SEO strategy? How do different aspects of social media and ads fit into this? How do you convert your traffic? Um, before we dive deeper into that, I would also love to know how many people have websites that are up and running. How are you currently attracting leads to your website? Like what are the pages that are generating leads for you? Um, feel free to pop your answers into the chats. Is it your blog that's effective and working on this for you? Is it your social media or email marketing that's attracting leads? What's helping to generate uh, those leads for you, or maybe you're not achieving the results you want. Website not yet live. Okay. I see a lead gen form. Great, great direct traffic from Lead Gen Forum. This is also one of the things we're going to cover later in the session. LinkedIn connections. Okay. Interactions on social media. So I'm seeing mostly social media, Lead Gen Forum, um, LinkedIn. So mostly social media. Awesome. Face to face. Okay. So I would assume in the current environment that would be Zoom meetings. Website, okay. And referrals, awesome. Okay, so let's figure out how to do this in a more strategic way and be able to build upon what you already have. But keep your chat open because I'm also gonna ask you a few more questions in just a moment. When it comes to when it comes to uh, persona development, it's really important to know who you're selling to and what their problems are, um, as well as pain points. I would also love to know who knows who their customers are and what the pain they're solving for. I want you to be as detailed as possible if you're comfortable 
what's the pain point your customers are experiencing that your solution can solve for, how much do you know about your customers, how specific can you get about who your customers are. So like when you're thinking about your buyer persona, I want you to not just think about their pain points, but also their buying journey. Um, how is it and when do you want them to find out about you? So I would love to hear about, uh, I would love to hear some of your thoughts on that. You have any? So not seeing any answers yet in the chat. So I'll just check in a minute. I see one. Clean tech hardware. Got it. Oh, okay. See the answers popping up now. Great. Okay, awesome. Awesome. These are really great answers. Awesome. Um, so let's talk about what a buy persona is for those of you who don't know. Um, a buyer persona is a semi-fictional generalized human representation of your ideal customer based on data, interviews, and some educated guesses. I would also caveat to this to say it's not only important to have a buyer persona, but also to have an anti-persona who you aren't marketing and selling to. You have to figure out who you're not trying to actively sell to because that's not your target market and where you get the most return from. Not everyone's going to buy your products, nor should you want them to. Um, you want to also just make sure that it's not just about selling your products, but selling to people who will retain and turn into um, active advocates of your business or brand. You don't want to sell to people that are not a great fit because that's a great short-term strategy, but a horrible long-term strategy. It's a definition of your ideal buyer presented in such a way that sounds like it's almost talking about a specific person. And this makes it easy for your team to remember your persona down the line and keep them in the front of their minds. So your um, buyer persona is made up of two different categories, demographic uh, and psychographic factors. So demographic data is more fact-based than basic information like age, location, employment status, le uh, income level, family, um, et cetera. Uh, psychographic data is information about your buyer's thoughts, opinions, and aspirations. It's really important to be thinking about these uh, psychographic factors because that's how you figure out your marketing messaging uh, and how to sell to them. Think about what their motivations, goals, and challenges are. What are their specific pain points that you're trying to solve for? It's going to be a process of just fleshing that out. Um, I'll provide the template to build your buyer persona afterwards, but keep in mind that building your buyer persona is also an evolving process. As you do more research and learn more about your audience, who your product is appealing to, you're going to keep tweaking and refining your buyer persona as you go. But why should we create buyer personas? So this helps us create targeted contents to attract the right people to your website and to your products that will actually convert. The content that you create is solving the problems and challenges of your buyer persona. When I say content creation, this also comes back to inbound marketing. So no matter how clever your copy, compelling your story or powerful your messages, if it doesn't resonate with your specific buyer persona, or target audience, it will likely not be successful. Uh, before you create any piece of content, whether it's uh, a social message or blog post or even a marketing campaign, you should ask yourself, who is this for? This is why inbound marketing starts with defining your buyer persona. Um, to put things into uh, perspectives and give you more specific ideas, I'm gonna show you who HubSpot's core buyer personas are. So we have different buyer personas for different markets, but I want to talk a little more about marketing Michelle in this instance. So this is just an example. And when I first saw this, um, when I first joined HubSpot, I was like, oh my God, this is a lot. Like, how do you have this 
detailed information about your buyers. This level of information seems like something that's out of reach. So I had to wrap my head around, but let's talk about how to do that. Um, you can see all her demographic information up, up here, um, her role, the size of her company, et cetera. Apart from that, you also have her priorities and what it is that she values because then you know how to position yourself and align your value proposition with her. What does she aspire to become? So for HubSpot, we're a software solution, right? So if I'm selling to Marketing Michelle and I know that she's trying to move up her rank to be a CMO, then I'm going to think about how adapting my solution, our solution, can help her showcase her talents and expand her efforts so that she's able to get to the next level. Um, I also need to have an understanding of her pain points, other similar services or solutions that she may use and how she's currently solving her problems uh, with or without the solution and products. For instance, HubSpot has a freemium model, a free CRM that everyone can download and use. Is she somebody that leans into other freemium options? Who does she go to when it comes to a new, uh, when it comes to new tech stack and how does she make decisions? This is all extremely important. Is she somebody that makes all these decisions herself? Does she lean on her network? How is it that she converts? She likes to sign up for free tools, but treats them like a trial. Um, if she's convinced her team, her team needs something, she'll follow a traditional purchase process versus a streamlined process without human interaction. So these are really important distinctions to make. As you're defining and developing your own buyer persona, again, you'll be provided a great template to work with. Keep in mind that the most important information to uncover is the goal or challenge they face. And during this discovery phase, I recommend you speak with as many different individuals as time will allow from your own salespeople or support folks to past customers and prospects. The wider the pool, the easier it will be to craft a truly viable buyer persona. Um, there are literally many questions you can ask, but with the first customers you get, ask them how they found out about you. What led them to your solution? What were they using before? Um, you know, get some of that information, but also ask questions like, when would you have liked to find out about us and from who? When would it have been ideal for you to find out about our products? Try to dig as deep as possible and continue to refine your buyer persona because that information is so valuable in uh, to you in making sure that you're, uh, you're strategic in your outreach and marketing. Finally, quick note about uh, what buyer personas are not. It's not uncommon for marketers or businesses to define all types of individuals that your company can do business with. So for example, a company that offers a solution to uh, salespeople might create one buyer persona for sales reps, one another for sales managers, another for sales directors, and perhaps another for uh, sales VPs, or even another for C-suites. That's not quite right. Don't confuse buyer personas with job functions. The best way to group your buyer personas is by a goal they're looking to achieve or challenge they're looking to overcome. And that's the most meaningful and powerful way of grouping them together. So now that you have your buyer persona, you know who you want to reach out to. How do you get them to find out about you? Um, so when it comes to getting found online, first thing that comes up in people's minds is Google. People think that if they just build a website and it's out there, they'll get found. Unfortunately, that's not how it generally happens anymore. Um, let's talk a little bit about how search engines work. So previously, if you were going to do a search on Google, it was more about keywords. So if I wanted something like the abbreviations for all 50 states, I would just type in state abbreviations. But these days, you're looking for more conversational words and phrases. So people with the um, advent of your Google speaker is your Alexa. On your phone, people are asking questions more like, what are the abbreviations for all 50 states? And they're asking these things in a very conversational tone. So Google has updated their search algorithms to add this. Um, so what this means for you is that previously you could rank and get great SEO by just owning 10 to 20 keywords. While keywords are great, 
um, are still great. This has become a much more crowded marketplace and having just 10 to 20 keywords isn't going to be your most effective strategy because it's incredibly expensive to be able to rank in some of these areas and, do, and to be able to own these keywords. But also it's not how people are generally searching anymore. So what you want to be thinking about is long tail keywords to purchase. So it's no longer um, just about understanding your buyer persona and what questions they have, but now, but how they will ask those questions. These are much more affordable. You can buy more, it can target um, a really specific persona. So if you know that your persona, for example, is looking for ethnic foods, instead of purchasing ethnic foods, you might want to purchase the entire phrase, where can I find ethnic foods in my area? What ethnic food options near me? Um, you would purchase an entire sentence because if they type that sentence in, trust me, you're going to rank, um, you're going to rank number one in Google in their search. And that's just an idea of why defining your buyer persona is really important and how you can use this to be more strategic and to stretch your budget. Uh, let's also talk a little more about the next chapter of search and how SEO is evolving. There are three major shifts that have happened. Uh, there's one that shifts from answers to journeys. So Google knows that you don't sit down to plan your entire vacation to Costa Rica in one city. So it creates an activity card for you. So when you revisit a query that's related to something in the past, then it's going to show you the previous sites that you've already visited and the relevant pages to this. It's, a, it's, a, it's already a little bit biased, the things that your persona has already searched. The second shift is a shift from queries to query lists. So they want to be able to predict what you're going to search for before you even search for it. Um, let's say I'm researching my trip to Costa Rica. When I log on next, there might be something around best places to eat in San Jose. This helps you come across things that you haven't even started looking for. So your original rank is going to be really important here. And the third shift is a shift from text to more uh, visual answers. So it's not just how do I make sure that I have the textual answer, but are they looking for a video, a shopping list, um, or an infographic? So it's not just about putting the information out there in the easiest way for you to do it, because I know that's tempting as an entrepreneur. You're like, let me just check these things off the box, but Google will actually figure out what type of response your persona is looking for and service those first. So we're gonna, we're gonna shift to talk about um, topic clustering. Who has heard of topic clusters before? So drop it into the chat for me. Do you feel confident about it? You've heard of the word before, don't really know what it means or absolutely have no idea. New to me, I've never heard of it. I've heard of it, but want to learn more, new to me. Okay, awesome, awesome. No clue. Okay, that's great. And I'm glad you guys tuned in for this session. Um, so I'm seeing the majority of you are saying you have no idea and totally fine. We're gonna go over a good overview of this. And then also if you want more information on topic clustering, search topic clustering HubSpot and you can see we have great articles and resources um, as well as videos that you can use to upscale yourself in this area. So we all know uh, the fundamental things about SEO, like having the right meta tags or text descriptions. This is important, but it's table stakes now. Um, you have to have that to rank anywhere. It's not going to differentiate you. So definitely learn that and incorporate it into your strategy and your sites. But you need to be thinking about strategy beyond that. So in order to differentiate yourself and one of the ways that you can do that is through topic clustering strategy. So we've talked about how people search for you. Now we're gonna talk a bit about how to create content that works with this new SEO strategy um, and that we know is going to service. And how do you service your site in the most effective way possible? Um, you wanna make sure that you're structuring your site in a way that search engines, as well as people visiting, understand how things are related, what information is most important. 
So things that are important to your overall strategy are backlinks. Backlinks are when you have an external site that will link to yours. Um, when Launch New York says, okay, this is our new portfolio company here, a link to this company, that's a backlink that improves your SEO rating. What we also found though, is that backlinks aren't only effective from external sites, they're also affected uh, internally. So we want to be able to show how these different pieces of information related so SEO can uh, help people on that journey. When you link your content together in a strategic way, it can improve the SEO rank on all of your content as a whole. So how do you do this? What contents should you be linking together? You want to put things in topic clusters. There's a couple of different ways to do this. So in the center, you have your pillar content. And this is your core page. For those of you that are more block heavy, whether you have a blog or just a page and you don't have a blog, you still have a pillar page. Um, and this is going to be a good overview of your content. It's going to have external links to all the other pieces that are related. So for example, if I were to look at this, we might have a topic on HubSpot around Instagram marketing here. This is my um, pillar page, right? So I can have a general page on how to get started on Instagram marketing. And then I can have a reference to influencers, pay ads, um, visual content, et cetera. So these references all out to other blog posts that go more in depth about that particular topic. Um, I'm going to make sure that I have a hyperlink that directs to that blog post and a hyperlink that also directs back to the pillar page. This shows that all this cluster is connected and hopefully this is all making sense to you guys. So one company that I think is really cool is if you do a Google search for traffic safety cones, you will see that there's a um, there's a small business, their website that actually ranks above all the other big brands like Walmart, Amazon, um, and I, I forgot there was another one there. But you know that's that it, they did a really great job on their pillar page and just have all these different um, all these different uh, 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 different pages that link back to the pillar page and. You know, that's one of the ways that as a startup, you can rank above big brands if you have the right SEO strategy in place. I know that this is a new topic for a lot of you guys, but this is how you're going to get more out of your blog. It's not just about creating more content, but more so about making the most of the content that you have out there in a strategic way. So let me know in a chat, does this make sense to you? Is this helpful? Um, again, there are more resources about this on HubSpot's blog. Helpful, I'm glad to hear. Um, so we talked about how to organize your content, but how do, you, how do you distribute it? So an important piece of this is knowing where your buyer persona lives. Um, you don't want to be swimming upstream when you have content on Facebook, but they're looking for this on LinkedIn. You need to know where they're searching for that information so you can put it in that specific place and in a way um, that they're looking to find it. So if you're a highly technical solution and you want to release white papers, you're not going to do that on Facebook. You want to do that on LinkedIn. You want to make sure that your persona will actually engage with the content there. And this is the idea of inbound. So you, so you want to create content that answers the questions that your buyers have in places. They naturally go for that information. So that way you're early on in that search process um, and cultivating these relationships. So to give you an example of one company that I think this, did this strategy really well as a startup is PayPal. Um, PayPal, as we all know today, is the largest online payments platform. They could say, well, everybody or anybody that shops online could be our buyer persona. True, but that's way too widespread and not a great place to start in marketing. You have very limited resources, dollars, and time as a startup. So you can't do the spray and pray mentality. So what they did is that they said, where are the majority of these transactions taking place? eBay, who are the people that they're going to most appeal to? High value sellers on eBay. So they put all of their marketing resources into focusing on this core group and use that as a launch pad in order to expand their business. They focused on where their personas were at and how to reach them. 
So I know a lot of you guys are already le leveraging social media. I would also say, make sure that you really know what metrics you want to track with, with social media in order to uh, measure what's working or what's not. I'm going to go back to that at the end, but let's put a pin in here. Make sure that the content uh, you're posting is appropriate for this channel. Don't post the same content across all channels because people don't want to follow you on Instagram and Facebook to see the same content twice. People tend to have very different experiences on different platforms. So people look for more community interaction, more engagement on Facebook. You want the content to be impersonal. So LinkedIn is a platform where it should be, <coughs> excuse me. And less about a direct sale. <coughs> Sorry. And it's more about content that's educational and informative. So Instagram is great for being able to showcase your product, especially if you're, say, a restaurant or you're trying to show more behind the scenes, the personalized or humanized experience of what you do. This is a much more visual medium. And I know you guys already know a lot of this and there's a lot of great resources on HubSpot. So if you want best practices and pro tips on social media marketing, we have great things spelled out there. Um, but make sure that you're tailoring it not only for your persona, but also for where they live or engage. You should know where you're tracking your um, lead interaction. If you have a great CRM, you can re-engage them on the platforms that they're already on at the right time. If you're purchasing ads, you want to make sure that they're on the right platform and they're targeting people at the right stage of their journey. Don't push them for a, a conversion when they're still at the educational phase. Um, put your value proposition up front. Don't make people dig for it. You may have purchased at space, um, but you have not purchased the rights to their attention. So this is what I can do for your business if you click here. Be as upfront and transparent as possible. And let's talk about how to convert your traffic. Um, we're coming up on time pretty soon, so we've got, we still got a lot to cover, but hang in here, guys. So once you build the traffic, how do you figure out who's a good fit for your business and why? This is a really important idea. You need to be able to add more value than you extract. If you're trying to extract more value than you add, this is where friction comes into play and where people don't convert. To give you kind of an example of this, um, so drop in the chat for me, what would somebody need to get your email address? What would prompt you to give them your email address? This is a good example of extracting value. So pop it into the chat, let me know. Um, what would it take for you to give someone your email address? And there's a million forms online and we've all been asked to give our email addresses a million times um, in order to get and under what circumstances would you actually give it? Okay, is your pillar page promotion or creating an account for it? Oh, there are some really good social media sites Okay, so, so the point is, in order to get more information, you have to be adding more value. When you have forms on your page or different ways to convert people, you need to make sure that you, your ask is in balance to your offer. So we've talked a lot more about best practices, but how do you actually convert people to your page? So first of all, having a, a CRM is absolutely essential. You need to have a place where you store the information and know who has interacted with your sites, how and what information you've gathered from them. You don't wanna be playing catch up and trying to do this later as so you start converting them. So one example is converting through landing pages. Um, so we've talked about blogs, social media. Let's talk about what that flow would look like. This is my colleague's uh, friend's business. She's a private vegan chef in Boston. She has a blog and her first blog post is very educational. This is about inbound marketing, um, bringing people in. So her blog post was, um, you know, what are the top 10 benefits of plant-based lifestyle? People who click on it, read it, it's not pushing her solution, but saying that these are the benefits. And then at the end it says, I would love to give you some free 
uh, free recipes, click here for free recipes. Um, so it's a very low ask. So we just want to start collecting some basic information first. Um, you know, first name, last name, email, and questions that can help qualify that prospect because you don't have a lot of time. You don't want to be talking to all the prospects that aren't the right fit. In this case, the qualifying question is where um, is where did the majority of your meals come from? Um, she wants to know if you cook everything yourself. That might that might not be the best fit. If you order takeout every night, that could be a good fit. So she starts to collect this information and qualify those who filled out the form. As anybody puts this in, it will upload to the CRM system and start creating a profile for them. So if they engage with you on chat, social, or email, um, or if they send if they send a Facebook message, that that will all update into their contact record within the CRM. Big piece of advice that I see a lot, make sure you have a call to action to your blog post. Don't just put blog posts out there without telling people what you want them to do with your information. Do you want them to fill out a form? Do you want them to click here for a free offer? Have a very clear call to action to help convert them. But what you want to think about is how to fit this into a flow. So they found your blog, click on a call to action, fill out this form and automatically get that offer, but then they will get an email from you saying, hey, here's the recipes that you wanted. And if you're still interested in this, you might be interested in this next blog post and this is the content offer for that. So you want to be cultivating them. You want to live in their inbox as well. They go to the next blog post and um, when they get in there, there's a bigger offer, collecting a little bit more information about them this time. This is where you want to start asking some of those qualifying questions. On that blog post, the call to action might be schedule a free consultation with us, jump on a call. You want to have different blog posts for different stages of their buying journeys to help nurture them um, through and automatically qualify them you need to have a system in place that's going to automatically email and qualify them as well as store all this information. So that way, when it gets to the point that you're ready to convert this lead, you can already see, you can already see what pages they recently visited, you know, click into your emails or follow up links and what have they downloaded um, because this is going to give you a lot of rich information about how serious this lead is and how you should be interacting with them. At this point, this is fully automated. You might have never even chatted with them first, but you already have all this information um, in your pocket. So landing pages are great, but chat bots are where it's at. We saw 7% uptake uh, just during COVID. You can set this up on HubSpot and other platforms as well. We're not the only one that uh, does this, but you can set it up really easily. This chat only took 15 minutes um, for us to set it up for her where it will qualify the lead for her and ask questions like where did the majority of your meals come from? What is your overall spend per month? This will also save into the CRM so that way you have great information. So you want to make sure that you're using automation for your closing process. It's great to cultivate them through this, but how, but then how do you convert, how do you, uh, how do you convert them? So you want a system that's going to automatically notify your team when a lead takes significant action. We're not the only system that does that. Um, you want to make sure that you have a system that does, uh, because 30 to 50% of deals go to whoever responds first. You want to make sure that the people you're responding to are the right people um, and that you're the fastest one to respond to them. Let's talk about how to know what's working. Metrics and data are incredibly important. I'm going to show you some of the things that you should be tracking and this is what it looks like within um, HubSpot. And there are multiple different ways to do that, but when it comes to your SEO, it's going to be an up and down journey, um, but essentially you want it to be going up into the right here. Based on all the different things that you're doing, you want to measure your SEO strategy effectively. Are you getting more clicks? Are you getting more impressions? Where are you ranking? You also want to make sure that you're tracking where your traffic is coming from. So this is one of the reports that's pre-built. Um, is it coming from organic search, 
or your blog or social media. This shows you where you should be investing more of your time and efforts and where you should be phasing away from or what isn't working. Make sure that it's not just about how many leads came from them, but how many of those leads actually became customers. So maybe you have a lot of people that are engaging with you, a lot of followers on Instagram that click, like, and follow. But if they're not converting into customers, this isn't your channel. And you, so you want to make sure that you're tracking those interactions as well and how your posts are responding um, so that you can be using this data in order to make better and informed decisions. So same with your marketing email. Um, within each of the emails you send, it can show whether it's been open or clicked through. Uh, you wanna make sure that you're able to gauge the success of these emails, especially, especially when um, they're automated. So I know that when I look at my emails, if my open rate is really low, then there's a problem with my subject line and that's not engaging people because you haven't even opened it. Um, but if my open rate is high, but my click-through rate is low, then that means nobody's taking action. I need to improve the content that's in there. So it's about doing fewer things better and more effectively. So I want to wrap up some key takeaways and then tell you a little more about the offer that's available to you through our partnership with Launch uh, New York. First of all, the inbound methodology is a framework to attract, engage, and delight customers. Um, you really want to focus on your buyer personas. This is how you really get a lot of traction as a startup. SEO should be focused on phrases, not just keywords. I'm not saying that keywords are a bad thing, but I'm just not seeing it as the only thing. Um, topic clusters is an efficient way of organizing your content and optimizing your SEO strategy. Last but not least, the value, add, the value you add must be greater than the value extracted. And this is a great quote from our CEO, Brian Halligan. Uh, to grow your business, you must match the way you market your products with the way your prospects learn about and shop for your products. Um, so lastly, the offer that HubSpot for Startups has for you through our partnership with Launch New York is if you are under $2 million um, in funding, which most of uh, you guys are, I assume, and are and not currently a customer. So you get you get up to ninety percent off our product in the first year, fifty percent off in your second, twenty five percent ongoing. If you're two million to Series A, starts at, it starts at fifty percent off, and then twenty five percent for the rest of your life with HubSpot. It's really easy to apply. Um, just go to hubspot.com/startups. But all you have to do. Uh, all you have to do is just that and it takes two minutes and you are under no obligation to purchase um, and select Launch New York as your partner. And that way you're eligible for the discount and you're eligible for whatever time you redeem, uh, you, you redeem it in. Also, as I said, our base level is free. So I would definitely start there. So with that, um, that concludes today's session. And I know we probably still have a little bit more time for questions. If anyone has any questions, stop sharing my screen for a second. Yeah, I think Emily, thanks so much. There, there are uh, a few in the uh, chat box. I don't know if you can grab a couple of those. Questions. Yeah, I think we, uh, Emily, we had one um, from earlier, which I'll just um, pull up. It was, uh, is your pillar page always the home page on your site, which I think was from a earlier slide topic. Um, not necessarily. So your pillar page is the page where you want to have this core content. And then from there, you want to link people out to different blog posts about a particular topic um, or, you know, different uh, landing pages about a specific topic. So the pillar page is not necessarily a homepage. Some would use the pillar page as their homepage if they don't have a lot of pages on their website up and running. Um, so I would start there. I would make your homepage your pillar page first and start building out um, other pages so that they can all be directed back to your pillar page. That's great. Um, I think another one we had, um, is there any trends currently in popularity for signing up for newsletters um, or do they need to be tied to a specific request or offer um, currently? Yeah, so, so any trends in popularity of signing up for newsletters, I think, again, this ties back to the concept of 
adding more value than you extract. If we've been seeing a lot of, we've been actually seeing um, a, an uptake in signups at HubSpot as well. Um, just because a lot of the contents that HubSpot offers is, you know, free resources on the internet and people tend to sign up for those things that they actually find value from and actually find it inspirational. So you want to make sure that the contents that you put out there is not necessarily always tied with an offer, but at least there's a clear call to action. So what is the call to action? It can be, um, you know, subscribe to this newsletter, subscribe to to um, our monthly newsletter, uh, weekly newsletter, etc. Have a very clear um, call to action to what you want them to do with your information you put out there. Thanks, and then I'm um, sort of staying with that theme. Um, you know, you talked a little bit about the open rate and click through rate. Um, what what is a good ratio between the two? Yeah, that's a great that's a great question. I would say um, if you get an open rate of like 70%, but your click rate is, you know, maybe less than 50%, that's not a good sign because if you want people to, if you want people to actually click through the content in your email, you want this open and click rate uh, ratio is somewhat, you know, like um, equivalent there. There's not that big of a gap or disparity in that ratio, um, unless your your purpose isn't for them to, to click through the content. And, uh, in the email. And then um, any um, advice on, you know, how long campaigns, especially on the paid side, um, they should be any minimum requirements that you're, um, you've seen? Sorry, uh, what was the question again, if you could repeat that? Yeah, um, how long, like if for a paid campaign, um, they should, you know, if you're doing a paid one, how long they should last, um, if there's a minimum that you should try and do, especially for testing? Yeah, I would say for a paid one, try to have it up for, um, I would say like for, for a week to really see, to, so that's how you can measure the results uh, more thoroughly. Um, if you only put it up for like a few days, um, it's not necessarily efficient that way. So I would recommend, and that's also something we do here at HubSpot is like when we have, uh, when we have like a new campaign, we usually put it up for like at least a week. And that way that gives us enough data to measure and uh, really dive deep into the data that we, we collect from this campaign in order to assess and determine the best uh, course of action from there. Awesome. If anyone else has any other additional questions, feel free to drop them uh, in the chat while we have Emily here for a couple extra minutes. Yeah, I mean, if anybody still has any questions, uh, more than happy to take them via email as well. Um, I think Danielle, Danielle will also share my email with uh, everyone who participated today along with the slide deck as well as a recording. Excellent. Emily, really, uh, really appreciate your teaching us a lot of new, <laughs> new concepts, new verbiage. Uh, we're all going down this road and, uh, you know, in the decision making process, it's really hard to know where to spend money <laughs> first. Um, strategy, buy the ads. Um, I'm actually really heartened to hear that even in a week, you can get good data to make decisions. Um, admittedly, in our region, we're getting some folks saying, oh, you have to test for at least a month. And, you know, as someone, you know, <laughs> signing the checks, you feel uh, a little concerned that we're sort of flying blind for that full period. So really yeah. helpful. I would say a week is the bare minimum. Like if that's only so much you can spend, uh, like try to have it up for at least a week. And, um, you know, because startups typically have very limited resources and dollars. Um, so I would say like a week is a very bare minimum, but obviously the, the longer, the better. Um, so yeah, so hopefully this was all helpful to um, those who joined today. And thank you everyone for participating today. And for this, I will hand it back to Arnie and Danielle. Terrific. And uh, so, um, Emily, if you're uh, willing to take some email requests, um, Danielle, can we put her information in the follow-up as well as just in the chat box? Yep, we sure can. Terrific. Okay, we want to let everybody go um, and head off to your lunch. Thanks for joining today. Um, would love to have some feedback on, uh, you know, your, your uh, you know, takeaways from today, but also what other kind of sessions. Obviously, we'll look forward to working with you going forward, Emily. Thank you. Thank you guys for hosting today's session. 
and I uh, hope everyone have a great one. You too. Bye-bye. Thank Bye -bye. you so much, Emily. Thank you, Danielle.